leadership of this committee that you've shown over the last five years. When we talk about the role of government in people's everyday lives, there is nothing more fundamental to what we do than ensuring the safety of those we were elected to represent, especially children. The bill we're going to be discussing today in emergency session will keep New Yorkers safe. Most importantly, it will keep kids who are walking to and from school safe. It will save lives and is the least that we can do for children in New York City and for their parents. This is not a temporary fix. It will replace the state speed camera law, which we all know recently expired due to cynical political maneuvering by the Republican-led state Senate. That state law only allowed for 140 speed cameras in the city at any given point in time. Those cameras were proven to be effective. They were proven to save lives, which begged the obvious question, why weren't there more of them? Our bill would broaden the scope of the program by expanding the hours in which cameras can operate and by allowing more cameras to be installed around more schools throughout the city. The State Senate, and particularly the Republicans in the State Senate, failed to act, so we must. Something has to be done, and it is our responsibility to do it. With the school year set to start in just eight days, we cannot afford to wait on them any longer. Given what we've already seen, there is no earthly reason to believe that, we'll be, that, that they will do the right thing. Shame on them for their failure. But where they have abandoned responsibility, others have filled the void. Governor Cuomo is one. We needed his help, and we got it. I appreciate the work he and his team did in giving the city access to the State Department of Motor Vehicles data. It is essential for this law to work. We, need, we needed Mayor de Blasio's help, and he gave it through agreeing to provide the council a message of necessity to pass this bill in time for the first day of school. Both the mayor and governor stepped up, and they both deserve an enormous amount of credit. And the state legislature can still decide to act. State Senate Republicans can still do the right thing. If the Senate Republicans want to come back with a program that substantially increases the number of cameras, then I would support that. And this law would sunset if we get a real and effective state program. But we're not rolling back protections for children. This program will stand unless we get something substantially better. This isn't about credit and who gets it done, it's about doing the right thing. Advocates for expanding the speed camera program also deserve an enormous amount of praise. I want to thank Paul Steely White, who can't be here today from Transportation Alternatives. Thank you, Paul. I want to thank Amy Cohen and everyone at Families for Safe Streets. Thank you all. Every single one of you. Amy lost her son Sammy five years ago when he was killed by a speeding motorist. Her suffering to me and to Joan is unimaginable. It is a grief no mother or grandmother should have to shoulder. The fact that Amy and every person here today from Families for Safe Streets channel their grief toward ensuring that others won't suffer a similar fate is a testament to their amazing character and strength of will. I want to thank you all and for bringing those beautiful photos today. This law will allow the city to issue violations for speeding in school zones. If you're going more than 10 miles per hour over the speed limit, you'll be hit with a $50 fine and hopefully you won't do it again. I am confident in our authority here. We have strong home rule authority on this issue, and I can think of no better way to use it. There are lives at stake, children's lives, and now it falls to us to fulfill our obligation as elected officials to do right by them. I urge all of you to keep that in mind as we consider this important legislation today. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I would like to thank all members of the Transportation Committee of the Council, but especially to Robert and Kelly, for all those hours that you have spent the last past day. You know, your work make a difference to allow to take us here today. 
I also would like to take this moment to dedicate this hearing to all the angels that are here protecting us, the beautiful life that they are somewhere. I always say that no one will be able to get the energy that those of us that have not lost a loved one are feeling when we are in this type of room. When we know that you are fighting not for yourself, but you're fighting to avoid future victims also, or great workers, middle class, upper class, black, white, Asian, Latino, who unfortunately we're losing like every week in the city of New York because sometimes elected official has failed to act. We're here today for the second emergency hearing on the Transportation Committee this month because we are on the edge of a crisis. Over one million students will go back to school on Monday. Some of them already started, uh, those going to charter school. They will be with countless parents, teachers, crossing guards, and school staff, all to make sure our children get an education and that they're taking care of and not sure each day they deserve to do that without worrying whether or not they will make it to class or get home safely. Make no mistake, speeding camera is not about just trying to beat the traffic or getting there a little faster. Speeding kills. And let's be clear, speed camera are not about revenue. They are about saving lives. In a perfect world, no one will ever get a speeding camera ticket. Drivers will be following the law and will be doing the right thing. However, until we reach that day when all drivers respect their fellow New Yorkers and follow the law, we will continue to need the tools to enforce it, especially in areas where our most vulnerable could be put in harm's way. We are here again today following on Governor Cuomo's executive order, authorizing the council to legislate on the speed camera and not fail our children. The most sacred obligation of government is to keep its people safe, and we intend to honor that obligation that some legislators in Albany have forgotten. I made safety one of my top priorities when became chair of this committee. We have passed dozens of bills focusing on traffic safety, and with the support of Speaker Johnson, my colleagues at the council, and in partnership with Mayor de Blasio and Governor Cuomo, we are continuing that critical work to keep our students safe when they walk in the surrounding areas of their schools. I'm proud to co-sponsor this bill we are hearing today with Speaker Johnson leading it, and Council Members Amprey Samuel Lander and Jonah. This bill will create a local speed camera program allowing the city to issue violations for speeding. The program would be similar to the Aspire State program. Owners of vehicles going more than 10 miles per hour over the speed limit in a school zone will be liable for a 50 civil penalty but we are improving the state's program in two key ways. One, the number of cameras isn't cap in the bill, and two, DOT can expand the hours of operation. That's what we need in our great city. The council is going into an emergency section to hear this bill, so obviously a lot of work has gone into getting this ready, but the real reason we're here today are you family for safe street, transportation alternative, and the 8.5 million New Yorkers and the 65 million tourists that came here last year that deserve to, work, to walk in safe street. Families for safe streets and transportation alternative made sure that no one forgot how important these cameras are. They know all too well that what we do here matters. Better enforcement and better street design saves lives. We can make a difference. We have worked together for many years, and I'm proud 
that they have let me be their partner. I owe them an enormous debt of gratitude, all New Yorkers and visitors do. I would like to welcome the first panel who are composed by the members of Family for Save the Street. Hoy estamos un día histórico con el liderazgo del vocero Corey Johnson, introduciendo, discutiendo un proyecto de ley que establecerá mantener el que las cámaras que detectan los choferes que manejan sobre velocidad puedan ser multados. Con esto, el speaker Corey Johnson, el alcalde de Blasio, el gobernador Cuomo y todos los colegas aquí estamos actuando con la responsabilidad que nos cae bajo los hombros que es garantizar que el millón doscientos mil niños que van a la escuela el septiembre 5 caminen en el área de la escuela sabiendo que están seguros. Now I would like to welcome the first panel, who will be the members of Family for Safe Streets. Will the members who already know that you're going to be testifying come? Rita, Jave, Martin, Debbie, Mary, Beth. You may begin, whatever order you have established. If you could turn your mic on. Okay, is that on? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Mary Beth Kelly, and it's been 12 years since I became an advocate for safe streets in the city of New York. 12 years since I lost my husband when we were cycling um, on a beautiful summer night, the same night this year that I got arrested in front of the governor's office. Um, we had been married for 33 years. We have two wonderful children. My husband was a physician, served the Upper West Side of Manhattan for over 30 years, a soccer coach, a marathoner, held the record for the most consecutive New York City marathons that anyone had ever run, and quickly. But we were cycling and had been doing that around the world. But on that night, in an intersection, a tow truck failed to yield and came speeding around a corner, missed me, hit him, and he died three days later from his injuries. He was the only thing in my life that I was more passionate about than bringing safety to the streets of New York. And every time over the last 12 years that a community board shut down a protected bike lane, I cried. And every time we made one happen, I cheered and wept again. But here today, I'm hoping that something very, very special is going to happen and I'm counting on that. I thank Corey Johnson, Idanis Rodriguez, Polly, the people who have been front and center in helping us, the family members of families for the members of Families for Safe Streets, do this work year after year, often without much hope, and particularly this summer, it certainly felt that way to get to a place where New York is more of the vision that I think we all would like to see, a place where a city filled with walkers, filled with cyclists, can do that 
harmless behavior in a way that keeps them safe and allows them, unlike my husband, to come home at the end of a day and embrace his children and carry on his life. 56 is far too young to die, particularly when you're in the prime of life. So I ask you all here today to do the most important thing that you can do in your careers, and that is always the right thing. And it takes courage, and it takes backbone, and it takes putting politics aside to step inside our shoes and for a moment feel the pain that is not yours, but actually could be, and that's a horrible thing to have to think about. But we hope that you will do the right thing today with the same kind of passion that we have mounted our fight for something that came from pain and sorrow, but hopefully will move this city forward. Thank you. Mary Beth, thank you so much. As always, thank you. Thank you. I already provided you with a printout, so, but I might not follow it exactly. This is my son, Asif Rahman. You might have heard my story many times. And my name is Lizzie Rahman. I'm one of the founder members of Families for Safe Streets. And today I'm here to show my support for the speed camera bill because I strongly believe that this bill is designed to save lives. Before I get into details, I want, would like to, you to know that why I'm here. I want you to know that. I already told you I have lost my son, Asif, and he was killed in a car crash. He was a vibrant, talented young man. <sighs> he was hit by a speeding, reckless truck driver on Queens Boulevard on his way home from a work. And the driver hit him from the back. He fell down. Driver didn't realize that he hit somebody and he just drove over him, crushing all his organs. And the truck driver didn't really only crush his organs. He crushed all his dreams and hopes. My son wanted to be a music teacher he had a plan to release his music CD and many more. And after this tragic loss, our house became silent as a grave. There, was, there is no laughter, no sound of beatboxing around the house, no b calling out loud, hi, ma. His voice has stopped forever. And this truck driver didn't just kill my son, Asif. He killed us all. And it's a pain like a slow poison. It kills you every day, day by day. And it hurts me when I think that I will not see my son graduate from college. I'll not see him getting married. I'll not see him having a family like most of his friends. It hurts me very much. He, the truck driver, didn't only crush my son's dreams and hopes, he crushed my dreams and hopes too. It's been 10 years. It didn't happen yesterday, 10 years, but I'm going through the same pain. And after my son was killed, I made it my mission to make New York City streets safer. And this is what kept me going. And I found a new meaning of life, of survival, by saving lives of other people. I do not want any other mother to go through this pain, the pain of losing a child. And I have been trying to attend as many events as possible to raise awareness for street safety so that our children will not die on the streets. 
I strongly believe that speed cameras will ensure that the drivers drive with caution and lives are saved. Drivers and owners should be held accountable for the safety of our streets and our kids. We know that speed cameras have helped reducing deaths and injuries on our streets. Overall fatalities are down to 28% in New York City. And uh, there is no doubt that, that um, if through more implementation, this number will even go down. And I want the council to think, think about a person, not the numbers, how many kids died, how many people died, or what is the percentage of death. Don't think about the numbers, think about a person behind the number, a family behind that person, and the community behind that family. Think today it's our child, our siblings, our spouses. It could be yours in the next time, who knows? It could be your child, it could be your family members, it could be your loved ones. So think twice, think twice before you say no. Please think hard and pass the bill for the safety of all our people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lizzie. Thank you. My name is Sophia Russo. I'm the mother of Ariel Russo, who was born on March 10, 2009, and who was killed on June 4, 2013. On June 4th, my family and I learned the ultimate lesson about how speeding in New York City can end the life of a child and completely shatter an entire family, crushing all the hopes, dreams, and plans you thought you had for your future. On that Tuesday morning, my four-year-old daughter, Ariel Marina Russo, was walking to school hand in hand with my mother. It was 8.15 a.m. when they were waiting on the sidewalk for the pedestrian traffic light to give them the signal to cross. The police report said that a driver made a left turn at 35 miles per hour on 97th Street and Amsterdam Avenue when he lost control and drove up onto the sidewalk right where my little girl waited with my mother. I remember when I got the call at work from the officer letting me know that my daughter and my mother had been hit by a car. I remember the moment he said it, denial set in, and I tried to imagine something minor, leaving them with just scrapes and bruises. I thought, maybe the car just bumped into them ever so gently and made them fall down, and now they're in the ER getting checked because that's protocol. But in the pit of my stomach, I could feel that this was way more serious. And so I asked the police, the police officer to tell me her heartbeats per minute. And when he said 30, my legs gave out. I was on the floor, and I couldn't breathe, and I couldn't hear anything, because I knew that my daughter's little heart was giving out as we spoke. When I got to the hospital, my husband was hysterical, trying to break a hand sanitizer off the wall and I knew she was gone. Going home that night without our baby girl was excruciating, heartbreaking, incomprehensible. Our apartment had her written all over it. Her Barbie dream house, her baby alive doll, the clothes she handmade for all her small stuffed animals from her socks, her artwork on the refrigerator, her clothes and shoes all over. And on her bed, the rainbow Build-A-Bear that she had just made. We had to live in a constant, with a constant sick feeling, like we had poison in us. Our son asked us where Ariel was every day. And when we told him that she was in heaven, he responded, maybe she's just playing hide and seek because that's her favorite game. And he'd look around under the table, in the closets, behind the doors. He did this every single day for six months. And we had to start therapy for our three-year-old because we didn't know what to do. As for my mother, she was in critical condition, required multiple major surgeries, and had to spend one month in the hospital. And she is still in the process of recovering from her injuries today. 
I never want this to happen to anyone, ever. I don't want other parents and grandparents to feel this. I don't want other siblings to go through this. One year after Ariel's death, I became a founding member of Families for Safe Streets because as someone who knows this loss and this pain, I believe I owe it to all New Yorkers and to all children who walk to school and to my daughter, Ariel, to do whatever it takes to prevent this from happening to another child, to another family. And that is why I stand here before you today, pouring out my heart and soul, retelling my darkest experience because even though it hurts to relive, you need to know what I know about speeding in New York City so that together we can change the culture of driving and save lives. We have gathered and analyzed the data about the 140 speed safety cameras that have been in NYC school zones as part of a pilot program since 2014. We know they reduce speeding. We know they change driver behavior, and we know they save lives. I believe that just as I have been called into action, so have you as our elected officials. Please protect our children as they walk to and from school. Increase driver accountability and pedestrian safety in school zones by voting to amend the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to imposing liability on vehicle owners for failure to, comp to comply with maximum speed limits in school speed zones with this implementation of the photo speed violation monitoring program. To those who oppose this program, I say, if you do not want a speeding ticket, do not speed, especially not in front of a school. Every day I wonder what life would be like if Ariel were still here with us. She would have been nine years old. She would have been starting fourth grade on September 5th. Her brother Jacob is eight years old and he will be starting third grade. He now fully understands exactly what happened to his sister. He knows about the speed safety camera program and he asked me to tell you this. My name is Jacob Russo and I think we need the cameras to keep us safe. It makes me sad when I think about what happened to my sister I get scared it will happen again. As a mother who lost a child to speeding, as a street safety advocate, and as an assistant principal at a New York City public school, I sincerely thank you for the opportunity to bring you this testimony. I pray no parent will have reason to repeat it. Thank you so much, Sophia. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Jane Martin Laveau. I am a New York City resident, a parent, and a New York City public school teacher. As you well know, uh, traffic violence is hardly a new phenomenon. Growing up, I was well aware that my grandfather, Benjamin Cantor, had been struck and killed by a reckless driver when I was a mere infant. I later learned that my great-grandfather, Heyman Chalfin, had also been struck and killed by a reckless driver. That's quite a heavy toll for one family to bear. In addition, I lost a dear friend and father figure when Erwin Meyer, director of the Kings County American Legion Band, in which I played for a dozen years or so, was struck by a vehicle, dying two days later at the age of 96. There's no more band. Over the years, I've lost my grandmother, numerous aunts and uncles, and my parents, all of whom I loved and missed dearly. But none of my family history or personal losses could prepare me for the news that I received on the morning of January 5th, 2015, when two police officers arrived at my door and informed me that my daughter, Lenora Laveau, had been killed in a car crash along with two other people during the night. I don't know how many times I repeated the word no. No, that isn't possible. No, it can't be. No, there must be some mistake. No, not my daughter. No, not my baby. No. I waited two hours for my husband to come home 
to share the news with him before I woke up my younger daughter, Chumani, and broke the news to her. And then the nightmare began. A trip to the morgue to identify the body. No one should have to see their child in a body bag. Meetings with reporters at Leonora's apartment and at the site of the crash, trying to wrap my brain around how a speeding vehicle had crashed into another car carrying my daughter, the two spinning around and hurtling into parked cars, ultimately slamming into an oncoming bus, wondering which of the impacts had caused the death of my child and whether or not it was immediate. Later in the week, another identification of my beautiful daughter laid out so peacefully as if sleeping in a casket. The receipt of a death certificate on my birthday. The last two times that I saw Leonora alive were on Christmas when we shared a meal that we had all shopped for and cooked together in her new apartment and on New Year's Eve 2012. The last time I spoke with her was in the afternoon of what would turn out to be the last day of her life. We were discussing withdrawing funds for tuition for the upcoming semester at Brooklyn College. My last words to her were, I love you. Five and a half years later, not a day goes by without one or several reminders that my daughter is gone. We just celebrated what would have been her 30th birthday, but she was not here to join us. Many of her friends turned 30 this year. They've all graduated, and many have married and begun families of their own. But we have to live through the numerous markers each year, birthdays, holidays, vacations, without her, wondering what she would be up to if she were still here. We know that drivers who receive tickets for speeding largely do not repeat the offense. And we, th we know that in a period of nearly two weeks, no fewer than 132,000 drivers sped past speed cameras with no penalties. We have a choice. We can let speeding drivers continue to put all of our lives at risk and go unpunished for their recklessness, or we can give them a month a modest slap on the wrist, that's what it amounts to, a $50 fine, and change the culture of driving in New York City and beyond. Speed cameras save lives. We must renew and expand the speed safety camera program to protect New York City's school children and communities so that no other family has to experience such a devastating loss as I and so many members of Families for Safe Streets have suffered. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, and thank you for being there yesterday. Hi, my name is Debbie Kahn, and I'm a founding member of Families for Safe Streets. My only child is dead. And nothing you do today will ever bring him back to me. But we'll never know the countless lives that will be saved by having come up with this solution to reinstate the speed safety cameras. When my son Seth was killed by a reckless driver, I knew that life as I knew it would never be the same. The driver was speeding through the crosswalk while my son was simply walking across the street. There were no speed safety cameras then that would help slow down drivers. So they, that's my sweet, smart, kind, generous, helpful, charismatic, funny, talented child Seth became a statistic in the epidemic of traffic violence. We, members of Families for Safe Streets, know all too well what the epidemic of traffic violence does to families and how it rips us apart. Our lives are ruined, destroyed. Our planned futures, hopes, and dreams for our children are now turned into nightmares. Just 
this weekend, my husband and I endured yet another family wedding. As the groom's mother danced with her son, I cried along with my husband. As those around us smiled, applauded, and cheered. We grabbed each other, and I couldn't stop crying. We live in our own personal hell that hopefully none of you, most of you, will never have to suffer. Traffic violence is an emergency. Someone is killed every 38 hours. Every six minutes, someone in New York City is injured. Thousands of these are life-altering injuries. As a mother, uh, as a member of the FSS steering committee, I hear horror stories every day from people seeking help or needing support. Speed cameras work. The data is clear. Speeding is down 63% and fatalities 55% in places where there are cameras. They are helping to change the culture of reckless driving. Overall, New York City fatalities are down 29% and up 15% in the rest of the country. Each number is not just a st statistic. Is it, ab it is about real human beings that were once lived and breathed and meant something to someone. Life is sacred. Life is precious. Lives must be protected. On Sunday evening, I posted the very exciting news on our Families for Safe Street Facebook page and Twitter feed that the life-saving speed safety cameras at New York City schools will operate again starting September 4th. We've so far reached well over 3,200 people with this news story. And the comments and repostings are far-reaching and very grateful. I, too, wish to thank you for coming up with this brilliant plan to reinstate the speed safety cameras, something that took Herculean effort on so many people's parts. Our purpose now is to fight so that no one else will suffer as we do. I urge you, I urge you to pass this bill, but that should not be all. There is no good reason, no good reason at all why should we, we should not be restricting these life-saving speed cameras to just schools. The lives of our loved ones are at stake, and I urge you with all of my heart for all of us to do whatever it is in your power, in your power, to allow speed safety cameras to operate wherever, whenever they are needed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Debbie. And we agree with you. Thank you. My name is Rita Baravecchio, and I am sadly a new member of Families for Safe Streets. Just two months ago, on June 25th, my 17-year-old niece, Madeline Sertian, was hit and killed by a reckless driver in Queens, right in front of an elementary school. My life and my family's lives were ripped apart. Maddie's mom, my sister, had her heart ripped into thousands of pieces that will never be able to be put back together again. The pain, sadness, and heartache is still so raw. My nieces, nephews, and my own children have a hole in their heart that will never be repaired. The tears are like knives stabbing the heart and there is nothing I can say or do to take away the pain. 
No mom should have to explain to her eight-year-old son that he will never see his cousin again. My kids never had a chance to say goodbye or to hug Maddie one more time or to tell her how much she means to them. Maddie will never have the opportunity to get her license or go to prom, graduate high school, or go to college. She will never experience dorm life or a marriage proposal, never experience childbirth or buying her own home. Her life was ended too soon. Speed cameras save lives. Turning them back on is a no-brainer. Speeding and fatalities have been drastically reduced in places where there are cameras, and many fewer people are dying in crashes citywide. It is a disgrace that the New York State Senate's petty politics is putting the lives of our children in danger. I am grateful that the governor, mayor, and city council are stepping in to turn the speed cameras back on. This measure will save lives and prevent others from living the terrible nightmare my family will never wake up from. Thank you, Rita. I just really want to um, thank you all for um, for not just today, but for uh, you know your tireless advocacy, whether it be you, Rita, who most recently suffered this tragic loss, or you, Mary Beth, who have been doing this for 12 years, and all of you who have been relentlessly advocating so that other families and loved ones don't have to suffer in the way that you all have. And I am incredibly moved and um, I'm incredibly moved by the testimony today, as I always am, and I wish there were words that I could say that could comfort you all uh, to, to make it better. I know that's not possible, but I hope that our action today and our trying to do the right thing bring some level of comfort that the loss of your loved ones is not in vain and that we are taking action based off of your heartfelt advocacy to stop this from happening to other families. So we will keep fighting. We know that this is not the end of the process. We know that this isn't a fix-all. Um, and I'm just extraordinarily grateful uh, because I really believe that without your advocacy and telling your own personal stories of deep pain, I'm not sure we would have gotten to where we are today. And so you all should consider this a very significant step forward that is based off of all the work that you all have done and the families who can't be here today, but who you're representing. And I'm really sorry to each and every one of you for the heartbreak that you've had to endure. Thank you, Speaker. And with that, again, thank you. My wife is a good friend of the Russell family they use to work together in the same school, George Washington High School. And knowing that you have dedicated in the past many hours to dedicate it to work with a student in specialized, specialized need, you know, and, and everyone here, like, I, we are here not as a politician. Like, I can tell you that as a father of two daughters, five and 11, it's like about you know, being so connected, and knowing that it's nothing that we can do to bring them back. And, and it's not only this member of this panel, but all of you sitting here too, that are holding the photo, those beautiful, smart, you know, great New Yorkers that we had lost so, so fast. So all we can say, we've been here in the same journey those of us that have not lost a loved one, we would never be able to understand all the pain that you're going through. And I know that you had dedicated you know, the loss of the loved one is to fight for justice. New York City and the whole nation, we really we always appreciate it. And we just come here to say thank you for this. And fortunately, we know that this is not the end of this journey because with that number, that one person will die every 36 hours. There's gonna be a new members of family for Safe Street that unfortunately will be joining us in the next couple of hours. So that's a bad news, that's a sad news, but here we are with great partners to say we are dedicated to continue fighting with you. 
So with that, thank you. Now I'm calling the next panel, represented by the Department of Transportation and the NYPD, to deliver their testimony. And I also ask the council to please administer the affirmation. And before that, I'd like also to acknowledge that council member that has been here, or are here, council member Miller, Spinar, Rosenthal, and Reynoso. Please raise your right hand. Four minutes, if you don't mind. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? You may begin. Good afternoon. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, Chairman Rodriguez, and members of the Transportation Committee. I'm Polly Trottenberg, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation. With me today is Director of Traffic Operations Policy, Juan Martinez, and we're joined by NYPD Transportation Chief Thomas Chan and NSE Inspector Dennis Fulton. We're very pleased to be here today on behalf of Mayor Bill de Blasio to testify in strong support of the pre-considered introduction regarding school speed cameras before you today. This legislation will allow us to reactivate our life-saving school speed cameras in time for the start of the school year in the wake of the failure of the New York State Senate to reauthorize and expand the program. I want to start by first thanking all of you who fought on behalf of this program. The City Council, particularly Speaker Johnson and Chairman Rodriguez, the Governor, our allies in the State Legislature, and a large coalition of advocates led by those who've lost loved ones to terrible crashes. Today, we, we heard from all of them, Mary Beth, Lizzie, Sophia, Jane, Debbie, Rita, your testimony was so powerful to all of us, and obviously I want to join in thanking you all for being here. I think the, the speaker said something very eloquent. Per perhaps today some angels are looking down on us as we, as we undertake this work. I want to thank the council for holding this important emergency hearing and for working as quickly as possible with the administration and the governor to ensure that the speed camera program is operating again by the start of the school year. The mayor stands ready to issue a message of necessity to ensure the council can act in a timely manner on the legislation being considered today. And if passed, the mayor will sign the legislation, allowing us to once again issue speed camera violations to any driver exceeding the speed limit by more than 10 miles an hour in a school zone while the school is in session. At DOT, we stand ready to reactivate our existing cameras on September 5th, the first day of school. As you've heard me testify multiple times and as Margaret Forgione, DOT's Chief Operations Officer, testified earlier this month along with Chief Chan and our colleagues, we know these speed cameras work. Speeding is the leading cause of fatalities and speed cameras are a fundamental part of our Vision Zero toolkit for reducing deaths and serious injuries on New York City streets. At a time when traffic fatalities have risen 15% nationwide over the last four years, as you've heard from some of our eloquent witnesses today, New York City is bucking that trend with Vision Zero bringing fatalities down to about 26% over that same period. And this year, we're on track to see fatalities decline yet again. And as we all know, these are not just numbers. As, as Debbie said in her powerful testimony, these are not just statistics. These are our families, our friends, our coworkers, our neighbors, and our fellow New Yorkers. New York City's speed camera program was first established as a pilot by New York State in 2013. The goal was to determine whether the program would be effective and whether the city could run the program fairly. At this point, five years later, the results are clear and unequivocal. Speed cameras provide predictable and consistent enforcement of the speed limit, which encourages drivers to maintain a safer speed, and that in turn reduces crashes, injuries, and deaths. 
And as we've testified earlier this month, the city administers the program in a data-driven and fair manner, always with an emphasis on safety. Our data show that at schools with fixed cameras, as you've heard today, speeding violations drop by 63%. DOT analysis shows that through December 2016, there were 17% fewer pedestrians, motorists, and cyclists injured in, injured in traffic crashes each year at schools with fixed cameras, and 21% fewer fatal and severe injuries annually. As DOT testified previously, major streets with speed cameras in every borough saw dramatic safety improvements since the camera's arrival. From the, data, from the date cameras were installed on a given corridor through the most recent data, we've observed the following. On Ocean Parkway, speeding declined 63% and 32% fewer people were injured. Grand Concourse, speeding declined 83% and 22% fewer injuries. Union Turnpike, speeding declined 80% and 43% fewer injuries. 10th Avenue in Manhattan, speeding declined 83%, 26% fewer injuries. Forest Ave in Staten Island, speeding declined 27%, 35% fewer injuries. And speed cameras do have a lasting effect on driver behavior, as you've heard today. During the two-year period between the start of the program in 2014 and 2016, just over 80% of the vehicles that received one violation from a speed camera did not receive another. That means drivers got the message and were deterred from future speeding by one $50 ticket. But already, since we've stopped being able to issue violations at 120 out of our 140 school locations, we've seen over 330 instances of vehicles speeding at least 11 miles an hour or more over the speed limit in a school zone at the time of day when schools will be open in the fall. As a city, it's our responsibility to do all we can using a data-driven approach and every tool at our disposal to save lives and achieve the Vision Zero goal of eliminating traffic fatalities and serious injuries so that we don't have, as you heard today, more people having to join Families for Safe Streets being part of that, that painful partnership. Faced with Senate in action, this new proposed law and the actions this administration will take to carry it out live up to that responsibility by ensuring that predictable and consistent enforcement provided by speed cameras will continue to save lives. On behalf of the de Blasio administration, I would again like to thank the City Council and the Speaker for their leadership and partnership, and we're happy to take your questions. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, uh, for your partnership and uh, for everything you've done uh, to get us to this point. Your team has worked um, overtime with uh, the great lawyers here at the Council, Kelly Taylor and Rob Newman, uh, to get us to this point today before school starts. I do have some questions uh, for you. If the bill, if this bill is enacted, will the speed cameras be up and running by our goal of September 5th, which is the first day of school? Yes. And how does the city plan to partner with the Department of Motor Vehicles to continue to collect information on vehicles that are caught speeding under the same memorandum of understanding that exists between the NYPD and DMV? Yes, I mean, the, the NYPD and Department of Motor Vehicles have a long-standing arrangement, and, and as you know, Mr. Speaker, Obviously, you were able with the governor to announce a deal through the governor's executive order that we will continue that strong partnership, and obviously having the state uh, as part of what we're doing here today will, will be very helpful. What steps do you believe the city can take to expand the speed camera program so that additional cameras can be placed near schools? Well, I think the, the mayor uh, last night was on Inside City Hall, and he committed to, once the city gets the existing program back up and running, for the first day of school on September 5th. He then committed to take the next step, which is to expand the program to 290 cameras, which is what was authorized in the bill that, that passed the state assembly three times and that the governor supports. So that's the next phase we will be looking at. We will start the process of procuring those cameras and, and considering their placement. So you, you still believe it is still better for the state to take some action here? I mean, I, I, I think, I think uh, you know, a lot of the folks involved in this deal have said in the end, you know, state action, it, it can streamline and clarify the enforcement piece, but I also think we feel very, very grateful that the council is acting today. We think the legislation you all are looking to pass is robust. It's going to enable us to continue to run the program and, as you pointed out, Mr. Speaker, to expand it. So I agree with you. Uh, you know, I, I am really grateful that we're doing this today and I feel like we're on solid ground. 
when it comes to our authority to do so because of the governor's executive order facilitating the continued data sharing with the Department of Motor Vehicles so that the Department of Transportation and the New York City Police Department can continue to run uh, the existing program. But I also feel confident that we have the authority and ability to expand the program when it comes to hours of operation and additional cameras. Uh, though I said this, and I think it's important to repeat it in my opening statement, we did put a sunset provision in this bill, and the reason why was um, it, it, it would be better if the state took action. It would be better, it would be easier, it would be cleaner if they took action. Uh, but in the absence of them doing that, we needed to come up with a creative approach to get these cameras turned back on, to expand the program in a responsible way, as we think should happen, but nothing really fills the void of the state coming up with a fully robust, expanded, strengthened uh, speed camera program. And so I look forward to continuing to advocate with you, of you, as you have done since this, what was called a demonstration project, began uh, a few years ago. I look forward to continue to do that with you. Um, Will the information shared by the Department of Motor Vehicles include vehicles registered outside of New York State? I believe it will, but I, I might turn to my NYPD colleagues to talk a bit about some of the issues with um, out-of-state information. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, actually, I'll turn to my colleague. Yes, uh, that's, that's not going to be a problem. And what steps can the city take in addition to speed cameras to ensure that pedestrian safety uh, is paramount? specifically around schools. Uh, oh, sure. go ahead. Uh, we testified last time here that we had a contingency plan. Uh, that has not changed. Uh, we are going to still nevertheless implement and utilize our traffic safety teams to uh, target speeding enforcement th uh, in and around schools and other hazardous violations. I, I went through a series of uh, our initiatives that we'll, do, uh, we'll be conducting and we have a speed enforcement initiative scheduled for the first week and the second week of, this, of, of our school year, uh, utilizing our neighborhood policing officers, our sector officers and community affairs officers. We will be commanding an additional presence at the schools itself. Um, our school safety officers who are civilians uh, that are assigned in um, our public schools, the uh, 1.1 million students there, uh, we will have our officers and we've uh, involved them in meetings and we've been meeting throughout the summer on this particular issue of traffic safety and also the cameras itself. So again, uh, they visit over 200 schools, uh, Uniform Safety Task Force from School Safety Division, those are police officers, will be visiting over 200 schools each week um, during this, uh, the start of the school. Um, in conjunction, our traffic enforcement uh, district uh, traffic agents will be targeting uh, parking violations, hazardous violations, parking and crosswalks violations where will cause pedestrians more difficulty in t terms of crossing. They'll be uh, issuing summonses out there for that particular violation. Uh, we've reached out to our Department of Education partner uh, and uh, again, they will be getting this information, uh, guidance to our parents and uh, recommendations for uh, people who are pedestrians, children, uh, to use additional care when they're crossing don't uh, assume that you're gonna be seeing, use the crosswalks, uh, avoid crossing mid-block, and ultimately uh, stay away from our cell phones and texting while they are crossing our streets. Um, again, uh, since the uh, expiration of the camera program in July 25th, uh, we've increased our enforcement and we're up 22% higher uh, in that last um, 30 days that we compared to um, uh, since the expiration of the camera program. So I would venture to say, we are going to set the tone for the school year. Uh, we are going to be out there along with our officers, our school crossing guards, our school safety, and as a team and working with our Department of Transportation uh, to make sure that our kids, our most precious gifts, have a safe school year. I wanna thank you, Chief Chan, of course, for all the work that you do um, in your uh, department uh, at the NYPD. I know that in the last hearing that we had a few weeks ago where we heard uh, a few bills related to uh, this very subject, there were council members that had questions for the NYPD related to traffic enforcement officers that were stationed by schools, related to crossing guards that were stationed by schools, and to understand if I believe the number that you cited 
in that hearing was that there are 3,200 traffic enforcement agents, but that includes people who are ticketing uh, going around as well. I would love, uh, of course, specific information on the number of traffic enforcement agents that are uh, stationed uh, by schools to understand out of that large number what percentage every single day are putting, being put, forth, put near schools for children's safety. Again, um, what our tra uh, traffic enforcement agents are, they're deployed throughout the city. Uh, they are doing summonses enforcement, traffic control. Uh, they're doing construction compliance, toll trucks, and, and a litany of other areas that um, they take a look at. Um, it's 24-7 that we provide coverage out there. And uh, again, um, it's not only our traffic enforcement agents. As we mentioned, it's going to be a team effort, uh, whether it be school crossing guards. Uh, currently, um, last semester, we did have some uh, traffic enforcement agents who are backfilling uh, the school crossing guards, but ultimately, the department has hired additional uh, personnel for the school crossing guard positions. So it's a group effort in terms of uh, dealing with the safety of our children, and um, we're looking to work closely with our partners in DOE and also DOT. Every needed uh, crossing guard position that needs to be filled across the city on all of the schools, both public and non-public schools, are those positions filled? Right now, the, the department is assessing as the uh, year uh, students start coming back, so does the school crossing guards, and we have to anticipate that some of them may uh, retire, they may not return for the school year. So again, we are currently assessing it, and we can get back to you with specific numbers as well, we get closer. Chief, that assessment should happen before school starts. We should have that information before the first day of school. Yes. We want to know, and we should be spending the summer filling positions if we think there is going to be attrition or retirements so that we are fully aware. Uh, if the council could swear um, Oleg in. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Oleg. Yes, Mr. Speaker. So what it, it's, as you, you know, we, we speak about this usually during the budget hearings and the challenges involved in both hiring and retaining school crossing guards, depending on the areas of the city we're talking about. What we've done is expanded the school crossing guard program that we now have in addition to the school crossing guards that we hire for particular schools. We also have a pool of crossing guards that we hire that can be deployed as needed based on crossing guards calling out sick, based on somebody not returning after a school year retiring. So we do have that. We've also hired school crossing guard supervisors and provided them with vehicles that they can um, deploy these crossing guards to fill gaps where they exist. On top of that, what we've also done is where we don't have crossing guards for a particular area, we augment that and supplement it by using, whether it's traffic enforcement agents, sometimes we use auxiliary officers to control traffic, but the goal is, and what we've, I think, got a lot better at over time is uh, filling all of the needed slots, whether it be with crossing guards, and which is the number one goal, is to fill all the spots, but Again, there are inherent challenges in some areas of the city, but we have plans to backfill and make sure that those slots are being filled, whether by crossing guards or some other resources within the department. How many current crossing guards do we have right now? 2,563. And what is the projected 2,563, you said? Yeah, that's, yes, that's the number I'm getting, and the goal is 2,638. So we're a little less than 100 away from what we... Correct, and again, we is. use, as I said, we use the additional resources that we have, whether it's officers, traffic enforcement agents, auxiliary officers, uh, to backfill those spots to make sure that we're not leaving any gaps in coverage. So I just want to be clear, before the first day of school, which is a week from tomorrow, we are going to ensure that the schools that don't have the necessary crossing guards, that every single one of those schools will have a traffic enforcement agent or agents, plus potentially auxiliary police officers 
or officers from the local command, the local precinct, to ensure that during arrival hours and dismissal hours, that those schools will be covered with appropriate city personnel to ensure the safety of children coming to and leaving school? Yes, sir. So we're gonna make sure there's a plan and, okay. Yes, I just wanna, okay. Um, so out of the 3,200 traffic enforcement agents, Chief Chan, that you had mentioned, how many on a regular basis are stationed and patrolled near schools? Our traffic enforcement agents are deployed, uh, again, based on volume, um, locations, uh, for an example, um, commercial traffic link tunnels and things of that nature. Um, the traffic safety majority of the time is, is, is uh, covered by our school crossing guards and things of that nature. Our traffic enforcement agents aren't necessarily deployed based on uh, the school programs so, and the locations. So that, that, that's what I thought, mm -hmm. um, and I think that we need to rethink that. And if you need additional resources from the city to hire additional traffic enforcement agents for there to be a certain subset of those traffic enforcement agents to be trained and to just be deployed near schools where the Department of Transportation and the NYPD have seen an increase in injuries, fatalities, speeding incidents based off of the data that we're receiving, that we provide that because what it sounds like you were saying is that the 3,200 people move around and are deployed as traffic is assessed, whether it be at the Lincoln Tunnel or the Holland Tunnel or other hot spots where there is congestion and traffic in the city. But what I'm saying and what I think other council members have advocated in the past is that we want a fulsome program. We want a program that includes cameras at every school, crossing guards at every school, traffic enforcement agents that can be deployed as necessary in the schools that need it, um, speed bumps, uh, other Vision Zero tools that we think work, whether it be shorter crossings near schools, protected bike lanes, things of that nature, so that we have a program that is really round and filled out. So I would love to have a conversation with you about understanding what your personnel needs would be for us to seek to do that with each other um, in the coming year. Sure, and uh, it's a, a continuing process, and the police department has streamlined the the uh, the uh, hiring process for our school crossing um, um, uh, traffic enforcement agents, and also uh, that of uh, recent uh, the app number of applicants have increased. But again, it's a it's a um, a constant thing where we're we have over 3,000 agents, but we also have a fairly high attrition where we lose almost 10%, uh, 300 agents a year. So we're constantly battling, but certainly we have plans uh, to move ahead, streamline to get more agents on board. Well, one of, I believe, the endemic issues that has related to traffic enforcement agents is they haven't seen a substantial increase in pay, uh, which has been an issue, and the vast majority of these folks are people of color. A lot of them are women of color. And we, of course, as a, as a body in the past, have advocated for employees to be paid a, a fair wage so that we don't have significant attrition and loss. So that's another conversation that we'd be happy to have with you so that we can have better retention rates. I want to add one other thing, which is I believe, though, again, I'm sure Families for Safe Streets or Commissioner Trottenberg or you, Chief Chan, may have the answer to this. I think that the significant number of the serious injuries and fatalities that occur, occur outside of normal school hours. They occur outside of the window of arrival and dismissal. They occur in the evening when the sun is going down. Um, and so one thing that I think we need to think about moving forward is to not be inflexible and rigid with the hours of crossing guards, traffic enforcement agents, auxiliary officers, and other folks, but to think about how we can potentially stagger and ensure that if there is a school that on a regular basis has a, has a large uh, after school program that has hundreds of students that are participating in it who are gonna be leaving school two hours later than the normal dismissal time, those students still deserve a crossing guard or a traffic enforcement agent or someone uh, of uniform personnel to be there to ensure that those children are safe as well when they're leaving school, so that's another conversation that I'd want to continue to have, and I'm sure that would need to include the Department of Education 
on examining which schools could fit a certain criteria which should receive an expansion of coverage from city personnel. So I would, I would like to have that conversation as well. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Speaker. I have a few questions, two or three questions, then I will be calling my, calling my colleagues. Uh, the first one is, I hope that with this executive order and the partnership of working together for, from Speaker Johnson, all of us at the Council, Mayor de Blasio, and the Governor, we will be starting in a more aggressive plan to get the state uh, to allow New York City to permanently regulate all matter related to a speed camera. Uh, will you agree that that should be our goal? And how do you think that this bill can advance in that direction? I mean, Mr. Chairman, I think I, I certainly know the mayor and I have both long said we think the city should have more control over its ability to use speed cameras and, and keep its streets safe for sure. I think today, obviously, the, the, the council and the administration are, are taking a very important step, obviously deciding to pass a local law and, and start to give ourselves more ability to, to run the program. I did also hear from the council speaker, though, there is also a continued desire to work with the state. So I, I think I defer to all the policymakers about what that right balance is. But I certainly think today, again, this is, I think, an important and inspiring day for the city to take control of a program that I think most everyone in this room agrees has, has saved lives and we couldn't bear the thought of it not being open and operational for the first day of school in New York City. And my second question is, how have speed cameras been helpful to use as a tool to go, uh, fight against heat and run? I mean, the, I think speed cameras, it's, it's quite simple, you know, having spent now four and a half years working on the Vision Zero program and, and having really gotten in very deeply on the causes of crashes and looking at, at what causes injuries and fatalities and crashes on our roadways. There are so many different factors, but the number one overriding factor in such a vast majority of the crashes is speed. And I've, I've said it before, New York City streets can be distracting, things can go wrong, but if you are driving at a safe speed, you have more reaction time, you're more able to react quickly. If a child or whatever, something pops out onto the road or you become inattentive, likewise, if you're going at a safer speed and there is a collision, it is less likely to result in a fatality or a serious, I mean, it broke my heart. I, I don't remember who said that someone took a turn going 35 miles an hour. In New York City, you should take a turn going five miles an hour. That's the safe speed to take a turn in this city. So the thought that someone would be going at that kind of a speed, if they had just driven at a safe speed, regardless of some kind of a conflict had happened, the results would not have been so tragic. So for us, the cameras quite clearly create a tempo on the streets which encourages all vehicles to slow down. And we think it has sort of the halo effect that goes beyond the immediate school zones. We like to think that it is also Again, and we're seeing it in the, the numbers for the city, that even drivers that aren't good drivers, hit and runs, people who are reckless, calming all our streets down has had the effect of dramatically reducing fatalities. But to Chief Chan, has the speed camera also been used? Is it a tool that we can use with the images that is able to capture those vehicles? Have we, can we say that the speed camera also uh, provide tools or images that allow the NYPD to investigate, especially the unit that do investigation, to identify some of those drivers that they have left the scene after they hit, crash an individual? I would, I would agree 100% with uh, Commissioner Trottenberg that is an effective tool, that speed is a, a major, major factor in terms of uh, uh, collisions and the amount of injury or causing fatalities out there. Um, barring um, a speed camera being in close proximity to a location where we may have had a, uh, a um, CIS job or where the investigators are looking for any additional um, videotape or cameras and things of that nature, I would say that it would be a useful tool if we need that to investigate it, possibly uh, leaving the scene collision, yes. Okay, when you, when you look at the data, this hit and run, have we seen an increase or decrease by this time compared to last year? The data on, on hit and runs? Hit and runs.
information we looked at, uh, it's slightly less than what it was last year overall. Uh, the number of injuries involving leaving the scene uh, has increased slightly. I don't have the exact number, but I believe it is up a small percentage. But the overall where um, uh, CIS, where it was a, a collision investigation squad is in, uh, investigating, those numbers are down for the year. Okay, and that's the number that, as you know, all of us are committed to reduce yes. the one of people being injured because unless the number has changed from the like 44,000 or 46 that we had last year, like most of them, they are damaged by, there's like a 4,000 mm -hmm. that ended with individual being sent in critical condition to the hospital and an average of probably one person dying every week as a result of the, of the hit and run. So that the fact that they have been, you know, some increase of people being injured is, is something that I know that we care, and I know that this is something that also you care from your role. And, and my last question be, be so before, before calling my other colleague is, what step can the city take in addition to a speed camera to ensure pedestrian safety, specifically around schools? And I, for me, the two specific one is about increase of the number of stop signs, and second, redesigning the street around the school. Is a plan already to continue, you know, making changes or redesigning a school around the schools that make those schools safer as also increasing the number of stop signs? Absolutely, I mean, DOT runs a school safety program and one thing that I have always said throughout this debate on speed cameras because sometimes the question has come up, well, why do we need the cameras? Why don't we just do these other things? And we've always said, we have an all of the above strategy here in New York City. If we want to reduce fatalities and serious injuries to zero, we don't leave any proven approach off the table. You know, we, again, try and be very data-driven and looking at every intersection, every corridor. As you know, we've mapped out for the whole city where the highest crash areas are. We have, I, I have to say right now, I particularly feel confident in saying one of the wor world's most remarkable team of engineers and planners who, as you know, have done hundreds of projects on our streets, street redesigns, putting in signs, putting in signals, speed humps, retimings. I mean, I think we have tried to do it all every year, and so far almost every year, thanks to the resources we've gotten from the council and the mayor, we've been able to increase our activities on the street. So I think the results have shown. We have driven fatalities down now four, four years in a row. You know, if all goes well, fatalities are down quite a bit this year, at this time this year as compared to last year. So we, we leave nothing on the table and we do a, a lot of aggressive work around schools, but we, we make sure we're looking at the data and putting in what we think makes the most sense from a planning and engineering point of view. Sometimes it's stop signs, sometimes signals, sometimes speed humps, sometimes redesigning a whole intersection, sometimes banning left turns, narrowing a street, putting in bike lanes. We have, as you know, Mr. Chairman, a whole toolkit of approaches. Okay, I think that probably that, that could be like a good hearing to have and if we can work it out with your team to probably do something at the beginning of September to go over the school safety plan program that you have so that sure. we can get, you know, continue having more conversation. So with that, it, I would like to call my colleagues first, Council Member Levine and go. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I know that he had to leave, but I want to thank uh, Speaker Johnson for acting decisively uh, together with the administration and the governor to head off this crisis in the face of really a, a shameful dereliction of duty by uh, the Republicans in the state Senate. And I think we should force every Republican state senator to watch the video of the testimony of the, the brave and eloquent, eloquent parents uh, of families with safe streets, uh, so powerful, undeniable. Um, lives are at stake, and, and, and I'm glad that we're acting. Um, Commissioner, we have four work days between now and the first day of school. Um, can you explain how much logistically there is to do to get these cameras act activated between now and next Tuesday? Right, it, it's a good question, and, and again, fortunately, we never, as I think a lot of you know, we never shut them off we just ceased issuing violations. So the cameras are still in place. We await obviously the, the council to take your action and then once the mayor um, signs the law, we are already preparing. We're gonna have to basically change some of the verbiage and the notices we send out because it will be referring to the local law as opposed to the state law. But the, the infrastructure is all in place. Our staff is still ready to go. So 
we're confident we will be up and running on September 5th and, and be able to start issuing violations. That's great to hear. You cited just a, a stunning statistic of 330,000 instances of speeding uh, of 11 miles or more above the speed limit. Uh, during just during this period where the cameras were inactive, so over a two-month period, uh, a third of a million, I mean, it's, it's a terrifying number. Um, I presume, and, and maybe you have some comparative data to past years to back this up, that partly this was an effect of, of drivers seeing in the news that the cameras were off and therefore being more careless in speeding around school zones. I, I mean, I, I have a feeling that may be part of what we're seeing. I want to be careful not to overstate because, you know, it, it, I don't know what's in the hearts and the minds of all the drivers. I can tell you this much, though, and I have my colleague Juan jump in. We do see in other jurisdictions where speed cameras have gone away for various reasons speeding continues to go up. So the effect does take place over time. Unfortunately, that thing which was previously a deterrent, again, a $50 ticket, which doesn't, you know, in the grand scheme of things, no one likes to get it, but it has an incredibly powerful effect. I don't want to add something. That's oh, it. Okay. I made his point for him. <laughs> right. I, I, th this is about deterrence. And so um, we're accomplishing nothing if all that happens is people speed and get tickets. We need them to not speed. And so I, I hope that we can communicate to the public uh, between now and Tuesday that if you thought, if, if you were mistaken and thought that you had a free ride, like, that's over. We need everyone now to be extra vigilant. Uh, we will, uh, Councilman, we will absolutely be communicating that. And again, I think obviously the announcing of what I think, again, is a very important agreement with the council, the mayor, and the governor, I think it's already luckily gotten a, a lot of coverage and, and believe me, I think the, the administration, we will be doing everything on our part to make sure that we are getting the word out that New Yorkers will know when school is back in session, the cameras are back on and we need you to drive at a safe speed. Um, a point that you've made uh, a number of times but it's just so important that it has to be repeated is this is not about the money. People who say this is a, a grab for money by the city Success in this program would be if we got zero dollars in revenue, right? This is purely about safety. And that just, it can't be repeated enough, and I, and I know you know that, uh, but I do, for the benefit of the public record, feel the need to make sure New Yorkers understand um, that all we want is people to obey the law and to keep our kids safe. Um, I will observe that unless kids live across the street from their school buildings, they're going to be crossing other streets where they could be at risk. And that certainly argues for expanding this program beyond the 140 cameras. I mean, forgetting about keeping adults safe, which we also care about, but just thinking about the, the patterns of kids who walk to schools and may walk many blocks and cross many streets. So I think you said this before, but, but am I right that you and the administration also believe that we should expand this program beyond the 140 cameras that Absolutely. The mayor committed last night on New York One publicly that we will be gearing up to take the next step, which is to expand the program once the 140 are back on and operational, ultimately at least to start with to 290, <coughs> excuse me, which was the number authorized in the assembly bill, which passed the assembly three times and was supported by the governor. And I think it'll be an ongoing discussion about where we go from there, but we're certainly committed, you know, in the short run to taking that immediate step. You, you are absolutely correct. We think we need to cover more of the city. And, and I, I want to thank you for making the point. I have said it, and I will say it again. We do see that speeding goes down when a camera's in place. We see violations go down. We see revenue drops. That's what we want. If the city collected zero dollars and everybody were driving a safe speed, we would declare victory. Wonderful. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councilmember Deutsch, followed by Councilmember Richards. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So, um, so I'll ju I just want to say that um, I want to touch upon a little bit what the speaker has mentioned before earlier. Um, so speed, speed cameras are definitely, are certainly proven uh, to reduce the number of speeders and to reduce the amount of fatalities. But we also must reduce and eliminate uh, any tragedy f from happening at all our schools, not only where there's a speed camera. Uh, in addition, 
we cannot only rely on technology, uh, we need to use that any revenue that the city receives from these, speed, from these speed cameras to be reinvested in keeping our children safe. Uh, that being said, I just want to bring up again uh, three points. Uh, when it comes to busing uh, to all our school children, from K through sixth grade, not all the children are eligible for busing, which then causes parents to either drive or walk their children to school. And therefore, we need to eliminate um, the pedestrian and vehicle traffic around schools by expanding busing uh, for all elementary school children. And I have a bill in the city council that's being drafted uh, for just that reason. Uh, secondly, uh, school crossing guards. Many of our schools across the city don't have school crossing guards. In addition uh, to those that do have, uh, don't have those school crossing guards to fill the gap that if a school crossing guard is out sick on maternity or paternity leave or on vacation. So we need to make sure as a city that all our schools have um, a school crossing guard and uh, this way we know that the children can cross the streets going and coming from school. Thirdly, I want to just touch upon the traffic control offices that um, we should have at least a pilot program that again should be reinvested by any revenue that comes in from the speed cameras to pay for traffic control offices and at least to have a pilot program because it might be very costly um, at locations at those schools within 100 feet to uh, in those areas that have a high traffic um, accident um, uh, prone locations and also in addition to keep traffic flowing smoothly around uh, those areas uh, near around the schools. So I think that putting these extra layer, layers of protection in addition to speed cameras sends a very strong message that we as a city and we as a state will protect all our school children. Currently you have 140 speed cameras um, so many schools don't even have that protection of technology. But again, having a whole package of protection in areas in and around schools, uh, that will make sure that we have zero fatalities. And listening to the testimony today um, was really um, a, a tearjerker, and I will ask the council if they can take that video clip of the testimony that we have heard today and send it to all the members and send it out. Uh, this way we could send it out on our social media because many people believe that the speed cameras is a, uh, a way to take money from motorists and from people who live in New York City. We need to send a message out that children have died, loved ones, have died because of speeders. We need to get the message out to everyone. So in order for me um, to, uh, uh, to be totally happy about what we are doing as a city, as a whole, um, I'd just like, once again, touch upon what the speaker said, is to put this whole package together of making sure that we have those extra layers to show our residents in our city that we are truly serious about having any fatalities around our schools, and we need to protect our schools 100%, not 99%. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Richard, followed by Councilmember Miller. Thank you, Chair, and I want to congratulate uh, everyone who's made this day happen, but especially to the advocates and to those who've lost their loved ones, unfortunately, uh, to uh, the traffic incidents. Um, I'll start with this, and I, and I wanted to acknowledge um, Ms. Lizzie Roman, your, your testimony was very powerful. Um, in your testimony, you said his voice is stopped forever. 
but I want you to know his voice has not stopped forever. You know, the work that you've done, I think she might have left, um, but the work that you do and that all of you do day in and day out keeps the voices of your loved ones alive, and I wanted to acknowledge that. Um, it's really shameful and mind-boggling that uh, our colleagues in the Republican Party in the state Senate would hold something like this up, you know, public safety for children. Uh, and this is politics, I would imagine, at its worst. This is why people are so cynical when it comes to politics. And uh, it's, it's, it's shameful. And they should not just watch the video. They should be required to meet with each and every one of you and look you in the eye and tell you why they are on vacation and can't go back up to Albany to do the people's business. Um, I have a few questions. Um, uh, this is for DOT uh, and the NYPD, so I'm interested in hearing a little bit more on what coordination is going to look like now that there's going to be uh, an expansion of the camera program. How do you prioritize areas? Um, and I'm interested in hearing a little bit more of how uh, coordination is going to look like for problematic areas and how those areas are prioritized. And I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off and then, and then turn it over to Chief Chan. I, I mean, we're going to continue the practice that we have used for the current speed camera program, and, and one that I, I think we have tried to take a lot of pains with and brought a lot of deep analysis, looking at crash data, looking at injury and fatality data, looking at roadway geometry, really trying to make sure we're placing the cameras in the place where we, we think they're going to do the most good and where I think we've, we've been pleased to see such great reductions in speeding. Our program consists of cameras at 100 fixed locations and then 40 mobile cameras that go to school zones all over the city. I think for the next phase of camera installations, we've gotten a lot of data from these mobile cameras, and it's enabled us to sort of survey hundreds of school sites, and I think from that help us pinpoint, you know, the next set of school sites going to be another 150 sites, pinpoint the next set that makes the most sense to go in and install those cameras. Now, we, we obviously are always in consultation with our partners at NYPD, because in addition to the data we get, they have their own data, their own experience from their own precincts. And I always, and I don't want to take anything away from the work you're doing, but there seems to be a lack of true coordination when it comes to crash data. So I don't want to hold, because I, I have two more questions, but I'm interested in hearing what that coordination is really going to look like when it comes to data sharing and really prioritizing areas in a way that makes sense. Also. You know, I guess I would add to that, how do we know where you surveyed? Is that data listed on a website? How would I know that you surveyed schools in my district? Is that information publicly accessible? I don't know, maybe Juan wants to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, in general, because we've had such a limited number of cameras in the past, and we don't want people to speed where they know a camera is not, we've held information about where camera enforcement is active. Not just Most cameras, but in terms of any studies, traffic device oh, well, studies. So let's not the, limit it to let me cameras. Let me start by mm -hmm. uh, the pedestrian priority plans, which are a joint project between NYPD and DOT, because uh, that's really the foundation that we build on when we are looking to figure out where we're going to do our work, right? And so we, we get together, we compile all the crash data, and we analyze it, and we try to find uh, those corridors, those neighborhoods, those intersections. Okay, uh, only because I have one minute. Okay. Where's that information? The Queens, uh, Queens Pedestrian Bur so Borough Plan. So there's a we website get it we can it, go it's to. It's on the to, website. Okay. We will get it to you. All right, and then the um, question I have for the NYPD, is there any additional um, data that you will gain from the arrangement? So you, you normally get information from DMV. Is there any additional information you'll be gaining through this process or you'll be getting exactly what you've been getting prior to this arrangement? We've, we've had a, a great partnership with the Department of Transportation. Uh, our statisticians, uh, they talk on a daily basis. If we have uh, a particular incident, we share that information immediately. Uh, we have the locations, the 100 stationary locations where uh, the cameras are currently set up, and uh, um, DOT has also identified locations where there are high violations on cameras, whether they're mobile, and we've, we're given that information. We've shared that information with our local precincts. 
the individual precincts themselves do an analysis on their collisions based on vehicle and vehicle, vehicle and persons and bicyclists okay. and things of that nature, okay. and they comprise a plan that will then target enforcement at those particular locations. Okay, and then um, the last question I had is, so I, this is a great step forward. Um, and I think the cameras will still be centered just around school zones, correct? correct. Why didn't we, did we raise the, the, the probability of looking outside of school zones? And was there a reluctance to doing that in this conversation or did we strictly just want to focus I mean, on I, the schools? But I, I would have deemed it an opportunity to have a, a broader conversation and I mean, was I, there a reluctance on the governor's side? Did we raise think, it or? I think there was a high level negotiation obviously involving the, the okay. speaker and, and the council legal mm -hmm. team, the mayor and, and city's law department, the governor and his team. And, and I think you can see, at least I take what the approach was to some ways mimic the assembly passed bill, of okay. which obviously there's been a lot of consensus, some decision in terms of expansion, number of schools and potentially hours, I guess at the time there was a decision made not to expand geographically, but okay. that was certainly something that the city has been for. And so, again, I think that I think that discussion will continue. I think today is a great first step. Obviously, mm -hmm. it raises the possibility of, of where the city wants to go next with this program. Well, thank, thank you, you for your for your work on this. I am interested in seeing a little bit more information on what school areas you've studied and, and that being more publicly accessible. Okay. But congratulations on uh, some great work. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Miller, Reynoso, and Rosenthal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'd also like to uh, thank Speaker Johnson as well as the mayor and the governor in, in making this happen. This is um, so important that we're here today. It is very unfortunate that we're here because of some of our colleagues in government have subverted uh, the process and, and allowed special interests to um, to distract them from doing the work of the people. And so uh, I am glad that we are here t taking up that, that mantle and ensuring that we're keeping our children, our, obviously our most precious commodity, as well as uh, the rest of our citizens safe in doing so. Um, this is an important step here. And obviously, um, we, the Transportation Committee and uh, uh, leadership of uh, Chair Rodriguez early in the summer, held a hearing on what can be done in lieu of uh, the cameras here. And so there were a lot of ideas that happened. And so my question is, will we be resting on our laurels or will we be implementing uh, some, of the, some of the programs that we talked about? Obviously that DOT has some of the other tools in the toolbox to, that guarantees uh, safety. Um, there's been some conversation obviously um, with members and uh, what we think um, would help this process along. Um, but we are uh, quickly approaching September 5th and a lot of the, the uh, suggestions and implementations we have yet to see. But we just wanna know that uh, we're not stopping at the speed cameras. That is one, speed cameras have certainly changed the culture, but there has to be other tools that work uh, along with that as we have this interagency intergovernmental uh, collaboration using all the tools in the toolbox. As a result of the last hearing, where are we? Let me, let me assure you, uh, um, Council Member Miller, we, we are not resting on our laurels. We have never rested on our laurels when it comes to Vision Zero. Uh, again, as I, as I was sort of saying, I think the view of the de Blasio administration and DOT, and, and I know NYPD as well, and actually some of our other sister agencies is, it is an all of the above strategy. Um, the city, again, in partnership with the council, has first of all made a profound investment in Vision Zero. We will be investing between fiscal year 18 and fiscal year 22, $1.5 billion in street redesigns, in traffic operations, in enforcement, in education. I don't know that there is another city in the country, maybe even the world, that is making that kind of an investment. At DOT, we have staffed up, as I've said, I really think with world-class engineers and planners. We are redesigning streets. We have a school safety program. And certainly I know some of the things that were discussed at the council hearing are things that we do. 
We do put up speed boards, we do put up stop signs, we do traffic signals, speed humps, protected bike lanes, but we do it very much in a data-driven way. And you know, happy to continue that dialogue with the council. I have to say that, that my team, particularly my, my transportation planning and management, my school safety folks, our traffic operations, we have a team of hundreds of people at work every day on the streets of New York. And particularly this summer, that's when we put a lot of our projects in, we've put in dozens and dozens of safety projects this summer, a lot of miles of protected bike lanes. So believe me, we are, I assure you, not resting on our laurels. We always know there's more to do. And, you know, happy to come back and continue that discussion with the council, but there's, there's not an idle day when it, when it comes to Vision Zero, I think, uh, you know, at DOT and in the department. So I, I know that uh, your staff and team have done citywide, and particularly in, 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 my, in Southeast Queens, Jamaica area, forums around Vision Zero, taking safety suggestions and so forth. And that has been probably a two, three year process. At what point have we really uh, taken that community engagement into account and really manifested it into real action as opposed to just coming in and saying, understanding that these are the tools that are available, but also considering the, uh, the culture kind of the, the, the expertise of, of, of the area there. I've, I've seen uh, in particular, um, and, and, and there's a good and a bad, we did a lot of street repaving, but the street repaving kind of creates a, a situation where you can go 10 blocks without stopping because there's no stop signs. And instead of people traveling on main streets, they now fly up and down side streets but we haven't caught up with putting the proper apparatuses that would control traffic on those streets as well. So we've had conversation, but the conversations have not transcended into real safe streets yet. And so they should, as we do that, we should know as that the culture is going to change as well, that they're no longer going to stop on a main street where they have to stop at stoplights and they're riding on the back streets, which are smooth, which don't force them to stop at all. I mean, I, I think you know, and, and I've, I've been to your district a few times, we've done a couple town halls, and I know my, my Queensboro commissioner and her team have been on the ground a lot. I mean, we try very hard to work with local communities to take their input, to work with community boards. Sometimes that actually frustrates our, our advocates and allies who want us to go faster, but we, we try and strike that right balance of doing safety projects, but making sure we are listening to local voices. They often strengthen our projects and make them better. Uh, and I think when there's buy-in and working together, that, that helps change the culture. I think when you look at the reductions in the fatality rates, and, and Queens has, I think Queens has actually been ahead of, in terms of percentages, in terms of the citywide overall, we're seeing culture change happen. Not to say there isn't more to do, and we're always, you know, uh, w one thing I found is, is we, we mentioned that we put out, uh, we mentioned this to Councilmember Richards a few years ago, our borough pedestrian safety action plans for each borough. We're going to be updating that soon. And I think it will be a great learning experience for all of us. We'll see places in, you know, in every neighborhood and every borough where our interventions have lowered fatalities, but then new areas now where we want to make a priority. So when we're ready to release those, I think we want to come present them to all of you and, and talk about what the next steps will be. Thank you. I, did you, Juan, have something to add? At the last hearing, you brought up the specific question about long distances between a stop sign or a signal. Mm -hmm. I know that we're reviewing recent studies in your area, and I don't know if a, a discussion's been scheduled yet, but I, I, I know it's underway. Okay, that works, because bad culture shifts, right? When, when, when the speed cameras are here, they go somewhere else. When there's no lights here, they, and so we just kind of want to make sure that we're holistically addressing this. Thank you. And before calling, you know, my colleague Reynoso, uh, no doubt that the city can, you know, I would say celebrate all the advancement that we've been able to make in the last couple of years because of the partnership with everyone and also having, you know, a mayor that has a vision with a great partners, a, a commissioner, Polly Tromber, that again, it required for be listening to all of us, and, and we in this body, we will continue bringing to the table a different area where we believe that we can continue investing more to make, you know, changing the culture on how drivers interact with pedestrians and, and cyclists, and this, this is our business, you know. It's not yet to be popular yet, but yet to be sure that it, everyone feels that they're safe when they walk in the street. So as we recognize, again, 
the leadership and the partnership that we've been having together. And especially today, the last 24 hours, 72 hours, have been a day that we're showing that when the city and the state, in this case with the mayor and the governor, and, the, and we together, the speaker, Speaker Johnson, all of us together, we work together, we get things done. So what we are showing in this executive order that the governor listened to us, this is something that we asked before, that the governor is also in his team be working with the other team at the city level, working with the, with the speaker side. And finally, I can say that there's a day that we can say that we can celebrate on how when we, the state and the city work together, we can listen in much better to the advocates that have been advocating for this speed camera to be sure that they, that they will continue running after September 5th. So with that, Council Member Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you to the Families for Safe Streets, your advocacy, um, which has been very impactful in my district, uh, and I hope that I've done my part and happy to see this victory here today and, and this short victory here today and that we have a lot more to do, and I want to speak to a lot more. Uh, it just really is concerning to me um, when we don't allow for the Department of Transportation to uh, be the experts that uh, push policy related to uh, what we think is of value for saving lives. Um, I just would uh, really want to speak to um, the fact that a lot of these families talked about uh, hearing a bike lane get shut down in a community board and what that meant to them uh, in their story. And the fact that we even would go to a community board to ask for a bike lane when we know we would ensure safety um, is always of concern to me. Uh, the same thing would go with the speed cameras, uh, that they should be positioned where the NYPD and Department of Transportation think they're going to be most effective and so forth. Um, and I want to play more to breaking car culture. Uh, the statistics that we have is over 300,000 people have been speeding in the city of New York since these cameras have been shut down. Um, or these cameras have been, not been giving tickets for these cameras, but have not been shut down, but have been played. Um, the fact that this city allows for uh, folks to run uh, uh, over 35 miles an hour, which is practically a killing machine, a vehicle, making a vehicle a killing machine is beyond me. Uh, we really have to start talking about doing more against car culture, including the NYPD and their collision uh, department, which I think uh, doesn't do justice to many families that are suffering um, and families that have been in crashes um, where there are fatalities or not, uh, and really want the city to start taking more seriously the fact that we need to break this car culture and start taking care of pedestrians in our city. Uh, so while today is a victory and we should all be celebrating the fact that we are going to have the speed cameras um, in and around schools, uh, we need to do more. We need to do a lot more. Uh, if there's one vehicle that's operating at an unsafe level in the city, then we haven't done our part to really achieve Vision Zero. And um, I want to continue to let you know that I'm an advocate in making sure that that happens. I just thank you, Council Member. And just, I guess I want to just say, um, I'm proud to say that I really do think in recent years, you know, we've, we've certainly worked closely with community boards, but I don't actually think they have stopped that many projects. And we have been building out the bike network at a very aggressive pace. I think someone will correct me if I'm wrong. I think we did 66 miles, including 25 protected miles this past year, which is extraordinary. Again, I don't think any city has come close to that. And I think to, to speak to your vision, and, and you know, I want to thank you for your leadership, particularly now, obviously, with the L-Train closure. I think we're taking some pretty bold steps we are going to be doing. We've started even before the L-Train with some Crosstown protected bike lanes in Manhattan. We're going to be doing those further down in the East and West Village. We're going to be envisioning, you know, really a bus and bikeway for Grand Street, a busway for 14th Street. So I think, you know, obviously from what we all know is this incredibly challenging situation. I think we're going to be doing some really big and bold things. And, and I'm hoping, you know, again, with your leadership and the leadership of others, that's really going to hopefully show New Yorkers what a city can look like that is less car focused, that is more mass transit and pedestrian and cyclist focused. We have a, a great opportunity to get it right here, I think. Just a, I guess, a, a more of a call to this committee to allow for the Department of Transportation to do its job as experts and data and then the folks with the data that can make a more sound and professional decision and not allow for anecdotes or stories in community boards to dictate 
the safety of the citizens or the residents of the city of New York. Uh, we would never ask the police department or a captain to move all their resources to one area or another or to take them out one way or another. We allow for the professionals in the police department to do their job, and I think that the Department of Transportation should be allowed the same autonomy. So I just want to make sure that I, I communicate that constantly in this committee. And I'm uh, always I'm happy for these victories, but I always want to keep pushing forward uh, because this is not enough. So thank you for your time here, and thank you uh, to the chair and to the city council. Uh, I'm always going to be here for you, and let's keep fighting. Thank you. Councilmember Rosent. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your, uh, together, your joint work on this, um, obviously life-saving efforts. Um, I guess I do want to start by speaking to families um, for safe streets. I don't know if you, I would really urge you to go back and look at the video. Um, your testimony together was incredibly powerful, and I do think it would be worth sending a copy of that video to the state Senate Republicans. Um, they, of course, should be ashamed uh, of themselves for uh, going on vacation without doing the duty and their, the people's, doing the people's work. Um, and I imagine you've tried to meet with them and that you'll continue to try to meet with them. You are skilled storytellers. You talk with passion, your heart, and I know many of you, and uh, again, I'm just very sorry for your loss. And thank you uh, for coming again today to tell your story. Um, so, commissioners, I have two questions sort of in the weeds. We've talked about the larger picture, but um, if I could just get a little bit practical for a second. Um, so can I first confirm that um, the 140, or the 160 will start right away? The 140, yes. Okay. Sept September 5th. Okay. The first, we'll have them ready for the first day of school. Is there an additional 20? The, the, the program, remember, the original pilot program was 20 mm -hmm. cameras. And then the next year, the yep. city got an additional 120. So it was a little oh, 120. Right. Okay. So it was a little confusing. When nope, we shut fine. the program down this summer, the first 20, yep, yep. we actually were yep. allowed to let them run a what's couple more months. Your timing, um, what's your timing? What are your thoughts about procurement for the next 150 cameras? Will that be done on sort of a? Um, requirements contract or will you have to issue a new RFP? We're going to be able, we hope to amend our existing camera contract and okay. we are committed to getting that procurement, you know, that part of it underway as quickly as possible. It, it will take a little time, but we will move as expeditiously as possible and, and keep Have they confirmed posted. the availability of those cameras? That's a good question. Have they confirmed the availability? Uh, Yes. They seem enthusiastic, so I believe the cameras will be available. I if think you could get back to the council sure. on timing, um, just when you'll have those in, how long they'll take to be installed, and up and going. That would really be great. Yep. Um, you know, the 330,000 number is just so powerful. Um, the thought of being able to identify 330,000 more. Um, with the additional cameras um, is just so critical. Secondly, I'm really concerned about the modicum of data about the school safety agents. Um, you know, every year during my tenure on the council, we have gotten uh, a report that uh, is part of the terms and conditions. Do you know what I'm talking about in the budget? And it's a term and condition of giving, allocating the funds to the police department that is required that we get a report on the number of school safety agents by precinct. And that report is missing for the most current year. So I don't know, I don't know whether or not you know the number of, of safety agents by precinct. This has always been a concern of mine because every year in the report, the information for my 20th precinct is never there. And that is my precinct with the fewest number of street safety 
um, school safety, school crossing guards. So um, did you ever even, uh, may I, I, I apologize for being a little rough, but do you, I'm not confident you have the data because it's required by the terms and conditions of our budget that you give the information to the council, which then puts it up on our website. It was term and condition number 56, I think, the school crossing guards. So um, I, I would like to know for my two precincts, I use this information because when I see that they're low, I talk to my precinct commander about the use of their patrol cars or traffic safety agents. And you know, those two options, of course, are not trustworthy because if they have an emergency, they're gonna leave. It's you know not their required post to be at that school. So I'm seriously concerned about the lack of knowledge by this administration where you have budgeted school crossing guards and what your actual number is by precinct. What's your sense of this? Do you think you have this information, just never got over to the council? If you have the information now, would you be willing to send it over now? Sure, council member. So I, I just want to make sure that we're talking about the same the same individuals. You started off the question with school Sorry, safety agents. I apologize. We are talking about crossing guards. Right. Okay. Nope. I don't yep. mean okay, so uh, what safety agents. I'm, I apologize. So that's fine. We could go back in the transcript. No, no. What I'll, I'll the answer the question with respect school to school crossing, crossing guards. guards. I just I didn't want Thank to conflate. Um, so. I'll, I'll speak to our Deputy Commissioner of Management and Budget who always, do, who always sends the answers over um, to the questions that you're saying have been unanswered. But what I can tell you about the general, generally about the school crossing guard program is we have identified posts for the individuals. And based on the number of identified posts, we know how many individuals we need to hire to fill those posts. What you're asking for is two particular schools in your district no, I've just never gotten the information about my precinct, precinct 20. So I have to get the information from the precinct uh, captain. But my point to you is this isn't just random data that you're getting over to the council because we randomly ask about it. This is information that's used by people who are um, looking at the safety of the kids you know, crossing the street near their schools. I have parents who count on that information and who hold my feet to the fire about it. Um, so I, 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 just to be very clear, and if this is confusing, I'll say it, I'll try to get it m m clearer. Does the NYPD know today how many school crossing guards are budgeted for each precinct, and do you know how many of those positions are filled? Not in the pipeline, filled. Understood, so what, I, I understand your question. What, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that I, the number of posts gets determined, it's not a set number. This school gets five posts, I mean, there's No, there's an I out really understand how you get to the number, but you're telling but me trying... the process of getting the answer to that question. I don't care about the details. I just want to know. But the details are important to answer your question. So I'm, uh, you're telling me that the precinct captains are going to decide in the month of September how no, many they need? That, no, no, that's not what I'm saying. So earlier we provided the, the numbers of agents, right? The number of agents and the number of vacancies are, d are based on the number of posts, right? So we know the number of posts that need to be filled now. How do we come up with? So what? Are, how so do we, you know the grand if I, if total. I can, you if don't I can, know the by precinct. If I can finish. Right. So, so we have. I the, missed that testimony. Testimony. I apologize. What's the right. grand total? So budgeted. We have um, twenty-five two two thousand five hundred sixty-three. That's the number that you Twenty-five sixty-three assigned school crossing guards. The goal is twenty-six thirty-eight. Uh, that's the number of posts. And what I, what I testified in response to the speaker's question was, we designed the program with the realization that certain precincts 
uh, have challenges, inherent challenges, in having individuals come forward to fill those posts. So what we've created is a program that has a reserve pool of crossing guards, and we've created the crossing guard supervisor position that can deploy th this reserve pool of crossing guards to vacant positions. Now that could be because there's a vacancy because we simply can't sure. fill it, or it can be that somebody called well, right now you Sorry, council member. I'm sorry, council member. I, think this is I get important. it. It is, it is important, but yes, finalize the question, then we can keep move on. Mm -hmm. Right. So the the short answer is that's that's the model. The posts are are created based on input from the schools, based on crash data. Of course. Right. All of these factors come in. The right. posts are so designated. You we have utilize, 75 we utilize these resources to fill the posts. Where if in spots where crossing guards aren't available, we have additional resources we can deploy, whether from the reserve pool, whether TEAs, whether auxiliaries, whether officers. So we fill the post. In the other part of your question, which is there is an outstanding request for data, I'm going to go back to the office after this hearing's over and find out what what the data is and make sure that we're, we respond to you. So according to what you just testified, there are 75 vacancies, right? Did I do the math right? Hold on one second. Two, six, three, eight. That's, what it, two, that's five, what it looks six, like. I just three. want to verify something. Okay, so correct. There are, 20, there are 75 uh, spots that need to be filled, but there is a class, there are two classes in September that will add 120 more crossing guards. So 60, I believe, in September 10th, and another 60 on September 17th. So again, it's. Are you I think confident right. that the entire 2563 are coming back? Well, that's and that was part of the testimony in response to the speaker's question. That once we get there, we'll see, right? We there, there are going to be occasions where somebody doesn't come back. But that's why we designed this model where we have this d reserve pool of crossing guards that we can deploy as needed and we have the additional resources. I appreciate that. I understand my time is done. I would just urge you to know the answer to these questions at least four days prior to when school starts. I mean, if you don't know today where your vacancies are, I think it's concerning. As a parent, I'm concerned. Okay. So, um, I hope, hope you can be a little more forethoughtful about it next school year. Thank you, Council Member. And again, the, that, that same this similar questions were asked by Speaker Johnson, so I think that the message I got from the Speaker, also from the Council Member, is that it is important for, for us as a city to know what is the plan and that we have in place starting September 5th when all the students, they go back to school. And also you hear from my colleague, Councilmember Rosen, that it is important that the city, city council will have all the data information that we know exactly how the NYPD uh, deploy all those men and women who work as a crossing guard. And, and assuming that those information is something that you can break down to us uh, by present. Okay. So with that, unless Councilmember Dodge has question so I just want to uh, um, touch upon what uh, council member Rosenthal said so you have a shortage of um, school crossing guards uh, you said 75 but then uh, you did mention that there is a reserve this morning I spoke to four different precincts um, asking them the numbers of how many how many requests or vacancies they do have um, there, there is a there is a gap that if, if a school crossing guard does not show up, you mentioned that there is reserve. That is what the protocol is, what you're looking at, what hopefully should be done, but it usually doesn't happen that way. Um, I think there is an issue also with um, how much a school crossing guard gets, pay gets paid, because a lot of even those school crossing guards that graduate end up dropping out. So what I would just ask is in addition to getting this information to find out exactly what the reasons are when someone does drop out. This way we could work next time in the budget 
to see, or, or legislatively, to see what we can do or working with the, with the administration to maybe um, try to figure out why they're dropping out and to work on those reasons to see, to make sure that it's appealing for them to stay, because they have a very tough job standing outside in all types of weathers, and it's very important that we that they get paid um, according to what their job is protecting our children. So I think that is a, a good piece of information that we need in the council this way we could fight for that and advocate and work with the administration uh, on that. So I just want to finally say um, with the speed cameras that it is important for the record, I just want to say that speed cameras alone is not the answer to everything. We need to have those extra protections to make sure that we are 100% protected as the best to our ability by expanding busing, which I have a bill for that, to expanding uh, traffic control offices in areas that have a high tra um, uh, accident location, which I have a bill in the council for that that's being drafted. And putting these extra layers and putting the entire package together with speed cameras that is when um, I personally, as a parent of five and a grandfather of two grandchildren, I will be happy. Thank you. So with that, uh, thank you. As, uh, as I said, thank you, DOT Commission, but also Chief Chan. Also, you bring a great partner, if, uh, you know, Vision Zero initiative. And now we have to continue as working. As we know, our plan is that Tomorrow, we hope that we can be voting this bill, our committee, and hopefully, hopefully uh, we'll be voting at the state meeting tomorrow. And we will send the message loud and clear that working together with executive order by the governor, working with the support of Mayor de Blasio, Speaker Jones, and all of us, that tomorrow will be a good day that we are being sending the message that we will be maintaining the speed camera. And more than maintaining, gonna be expanding the speed camera in the city of New York. So with that, thank you. and. Now we're calling the last panels. I, I don't know if, if those three great New Yorkers are here. Marco Connor, Transportation Artillery. Ariel Saransky, UJA Federation, and Vincent Region. Yes, at the same time. It's going to be in three minutes, so please, if it's longer, you summarize. We assume that there was not anybody else from the public who signed to testify, so with these three a, a testimony, we will end this hearing. Ladies first? No? Yes, let me be a gentleman today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chairperson Rodriguez. My name is Ariel Sabransky, and I am an advocacy and policy advisor at UJA Federation. We're also a member of the coalition. Um, so you've heard extremely moving stories. I think you know all the facts. You know that speed cameras work. So I'm just going to be very brief um, and just put on the record that we are extremely supportive of this bill passing. Um, we're really grateful for your work uh, with the speaker, uh, with the governor, with the mayor, to make sure that this program can continue to operate in school districts. And we look forward to working together as we expand this program because it is truly a very vital program and we need to make sure that no more uh, parents have to suffer the loss of their children or other family members. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to, tes to testify and we look forward to continuing to work together. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman. My name is Mark O'Connor. I'm the Legislative and Legal Director with Transportation Alternatives and I really also wanna thank you um, you know, on behalf of Transportation Alternatives and the Every School for Speed Safety Camera Coalition for your um, tenacity on uh, working on, on these issues for so, so long. Um, as I mentioned today, I'm also representing the Every School Coalition for Speed Safety Cameras. This coalition not only strongly supports 
your life-affirming actions today to reactivate our city's speed safety cameras, we encourage you to use your authority to allow operation of the cameras whenever and wherever needed to protect other New Yorkers, and at the very least, to do so at every school and every senior center to begin with. The Every School Coalition consists of more than 300 schools, parent-teacher associations, nearly every major hospital in New York City, doctors, school crossing guards, religious institutions, child welfare organizations, disability rights group, major businesses, four district attorneys, and many more institutions in New York City. Speeding is a leading cause of, of crashes in our city, and speed safety cameras, as you've seen today, have been an effective deterrent to speeding. We, at Transportation Alternatives, believe that the city of New York, through legislation originated in the council today, has the legal and the moral authority to operate an improved speed safety camera program that protects more New Yorkers than the program that existed between 2014 and 2018. Those powers are rooted in the right that we have as a city to legislate for the protection, for the safety, health, and well-being of people who live in our city and who travel here. Speed safety cameras do exactly that. They deter dangerous driving, making our streets safer. They save lives. Furthermore, New York City has extensive policing powers, including the general power to enforce speed limits. Traffic violence affects us all. As this council votes to make our streets safer, we urge you, Chairman, to strongly consider allowing speed safety cameras to operate at any time when speeding is prevalent and at any school, senior center, and naturally occurring retirement community. Ultimately, we hope that very soon our city will be able to operate speed safety cameras whenever and wherever life-threatening speeding is prevalent. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair. And I want to thank you guys for, for having this uh, hearing. Uh, my name is Vincent Riggins. I live in District 42 in Brooklyn. And just so I have some different opinions that may be kind of nuanced, but I want to give you some foundation on why I think they are valid. One, I'm a member of Community Board 5 Public Safety Committee, co-chair. I'm also the author of the resolution against stop, search, and frisk. Uh, once Community Board and the whole city submitted that, we did that in Community Board 5. I'm also correspondent secretary for the 75th Precinct Community Council. Great relationship with police officers. And I'm also organizers, uh, organizer of the Concerned Families of Star Right City doing the proposed sale. Um, to say that cameras is not about revenue is a moral way of showing empathy, but it is void of rational implementation. Now, what do I mean by that? There is a, it's impossible to secure everyone in this city, like the gentleman just alluded to, without considering revenue. We're not talking about, I'm not talking about revenue that the city is trying to accumulate, but in order for us to have zero fatalities, it's going to take revenue. It's going to take a partnership with the state and the city. That interprets revenue, cameras, cost money. So for somebody to say that it's not about revenue, just a little bit ingenious. Um, two days ago, I spent time with Carmen and Michael Hojita, right? The, organ the, founder, the foundation for uh, Brianna's Law, right? Over 7,000 lives had been saved within the last year just by implementing that law, and it took them seven years. So I'm here to just offer an alternative. I think creating a, a, a block between the Republicans and the state Senate, this body and the assembly is part of the problem that we are not getting the resources we need throughout this city. My suggestion, re make revenue an issue. Okay, my suggestion is that the revenue that's garnered from every speed camera, uh, school cameras, part of that revenue is turned back over to the community board or district in, in which the revenue was gathered. There is no Republican or any other elected official that is not going to take revenue for their community because they refuse to take a vote. So I think we will be able to solve that issue immediately. So we have to think outside of the box that we're going to accomplish what we're after. We can't make it a political issue. 
there, there's nobody, I mean, uh, this, this, is a bi, this should be a bipartisan uh, initiative, yet we're using it for political fodder in this political season. So I just want to share that with you. Uh, one more powerful suggestion I want to give you. Because sorry, summarize, please. Yeah, I'm sorry. I had, I am going to summarize. Um, I did have it in, written up a little bit better, but I left it running. Um, let me see so I can summarize for you. I'm sorry, sir. Yeah. We, need to, we need to leave it here. If there's any additional information that you can share with us, we will take it. But with that, this hearing come to the end. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you tomorrow, and hopefully, we'll be able to vote it from committee and also vote a state meeting. With that, this hearing is adjourned. Sorry, I went more coherent. <laughs> They don't like to hear objective opinions. Not within their scope of what they're talking about.